Well, it's a great piece of scripture. You may have heard it before. Uh, it's uh, sometimes famously called the parable of the prodigal son. And uh, I want to ask uh, right away, is anyone here uh, be able to uh, recite our mission statement for Trinity United Church of Christ? Anyone here? You can cheat and look at the bulletin if you want. <laughs> there it is. Embracing and celebrating God's love. Embracing and celebrating God's love. And you know what? That's what this story is all about. Uh, I was uh, up in Savannah, Georgia, um, two weeks ago. And uh, there is the uh, first black Baptist church. And it's the oldest uh, black church in America. And it was actually built uh, after the slaves had worked in the fields. They worked to build their church. And I went there on Sunday morning. And uh, one of the things uh, that I noticed that they did a lot in worship was that they had people in the pews talk to one another. Uh, you know, they would say, okay, tell me your neighbor, such and such. So I want you to turn to someone near you in the pew and remind them of the mission statement of Trinity United Church of Christ, which is... Okay, turn to someone in the pew and tell them what they're doing. Celebrating. Yeah, yeah, we, we know how you like to celebrate. You're all about the celebration. It's pretty effective, isn't it? Uh, did anybody not get told what the motto of it is? Embracing and celebrating God's love. That's what this story is about. And during the season of Lent, what I've been doing is I've been doing a sermon series on sin. And the problem is that most of the words that we use in the church have been terribly distorted and misunderstood in our world today, maybe no more so than that word sin. When we have confirmation class, we have a chapter in our confirmation book, and it defines sin for our confirmants as separated from other people separated from yourself, and separated from God. Sin is isolation. Sin is loneliness. And if you think back to uh, all the stories of the Bible, this theme uh, resonates. And I'm telling you, I believe that one of the greatest problems that we have today in our culture is that people are isolated from one another. That's part of what's happened to our churches. That we're, we're isolated. We don't share enough things. And we don't spend enough time together. But we can be isolated from ourselves, from the higher self we know that we ought to be. And sometimes we can feel bad because we know we're not being the person that we want to be. There are many times, like in our parable today, that we're separated from the people who are closest to us. We can be close to them, but we're isolated. And we can't be our true selves with them. And there are those, also those moments in our lives when we feel that we're separated from God. And that we're isolated. Now I was thinking about what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5.16. He says, we are careful not to judge people by what they seem to us. Because the way we judge other people, most of that comes out of our, ourselves. And most of that is a reflection of what we think of other people. And we imagine all sorts of things that people are thinking about us. <coughs> And most of those things are not true. And out of the isolation of ourselves, we create isolation with other people. Because we imagine those things. And think about this parable of the prodigal son in a new way. As isolation. This is a family that was lonely and they were separated from their true selves. The first thing that I want to say about this is that this has always been known as the parable of the prodigal son, and I had to begin the sermon with that so you would know what I was talking about. But what you probably don't know is that it was only named that since uh, the time of the King James Bible. It had that little subtitle on it, the parable of the prodigal son, but that's very misleading because it's in a series of parables that Jesus told, and I'm really grateful for whoever it was who wrote the Gospel of Luke, 
Because this is the only person that recorded this parable of Jesus. And it's in a series of three. There's the lost sheep, there's the lost coin, and then there's the lost son. Now in the lost sheep, what was the point of that? That there was a good shepherd. In the lost coin, the part of that was that there was a very persistent widow who wouldn't stop until she found that coin. Now why don't we call this the parable of the welcoming father? Or the parable of the forgiving father? So often we've taken this parable and throughout at least the last 500 years of interpretation of this parable in the history of the Christian church, it's been a parable about not uh, being dissolute. You know? Don't be like the prodigal son who went out and wasted everything. But don't get sidetracked with that, because that's not what this is about. We actually could have called this the parable of the angry older brother, couldn't we? Don't be like that guy. Don't judge people. Don't be angry. Welcome your family members back when they uh, return from places. And what I want to ask you is, how do people in our society view the church and what the church does? Do they look at us as the angry older brother that expects them to fall in line and, uh, and um, say bad things about uh, the way they've uh, ruined parts of their life? Or, or can we be seen as that welcoming, gracious Father that in our passage today is God. This parable often has been used uh, as a way of uh, being a warning about extravagant living. But in fact, this is a reversal story. It's a story where you think this is the righteous person. The one who had his nose to the grindstone, the one uh, who uh, stayed home, and it's the one that went away and squandered everything, and that's the bad son. Actually, in, in Judaism, there are these parables of the two sons, one's good, one's bad, and this, Jesus flips it. It's a reversal story, so in the end, the son who is the good son is the one who no longer wants to be lonely, who no longer wants to be isolated from himself, from his father, his family, and God. And the one who was there all the time, that you're with, is the one who by his behavior, by his attitude, he's the one who's isolated. He's the one who won't go in or to share in that. So there are three characters in our story today. There's the younger brother. He goes into a foreign land. He's isolated. Some of us have known that experience. We've gone somewhere and started to live all by ourselves with no connections. You feel isolated. No one helps him. Nearly every day of the week, someone comes to Trinity for help of one sort or another. Either they're homeless, they don't have food in their cupboard, they can't make it to work, they can't pay their utility bills. My first approach is to ask them, where's your family? And almost always, they're completely isolated from family. Completely separated from family, for one reason or another. And like I said, it might be something in their own head. I can't go back and cause. I don't want to admit this. I don't want to deal with this. But a lot of times they get kicked out. A lot of times, everybody that they know doesn't have any resources either. There is no one who could possibly help them. Isolation is a very real thing. People that we meet daily are isolated. And he becomes isolated because he thinks that he doesn't need his family, doesn't he? No one helped him. There was no salvation army back in that time. There was no church, and even if there, there was, would they ever seek the help they needed? Now there's the older brother. Now, a lot of people identify with the older brother because we get mad because 
someone got something and we didn't get it and they didn't deserve it. And I understand that and I hear it every time I preach a sermon. Well, yeah, that's a good parable, but you don't know my family. I've heard that a lot. And I just don't want the church to become the older brother. I just don't want to be the older brother that judges other people, that continues the patterns of isolation and loneliness that we have in the world today. The people that come back to us, and they're, during Lent, we have to say that there's a spiritual danger in trying to be righteous. And sometimes our concern for righteousness works against God's purposes. Now remember why Jesus told this parable. He told a series of parables. Because of the Pharisees who grumbled because Jesus was welcoming sinners and eating with them. You always have to remember that context for this parable. To judge ourselves by how much better we have done than other people is a sure formula for spiritual failure. To compare ourselves to someone else and to make someone else feel bad so that we can feel good is a sure formula for spiritual failure. And then there's a father. And I had a few moments when it was difficult for me to write this sermon because I thought about my own father. Think about what a great thing it is for us to have family members who welcome us home. I thought about the time that I was living in St. Louis and I would drive back to Moraine County and Henrietta Township, which nobody knows where it is, but it's up there, I guarantee it. It wouldn't matter what time of day I came home. I'd drive all day, I'd get there at 2 in the morning. My dad had the lights on, he'd be sitting there waiting. He was there to welcome me home. No matter how far apart we were geographically or isolated, and you know that story of how a welcoming father can change your life. And we all also ought to have that sense about how as a church, if we are that welcoming presence in a person's midst, that it transforms people's lives. And like so many of Jesus' stories, this story is open-ended, just like his parables. We never learn whether the older brother embraced his younger brother and went into the feast or not. We don't know what happened to this family. And the Bible always tells these stories. Jesus was good at this. And he leaves it as an open invitation. It's up to you. It's up to you, the reader. It's up to you, the person that hears the story. How then will you live? And we have to admit that there is something in human nature that can cause us to look down on other people or to blame other people for their problems. And then we also have this human nature, we project our fears on other people and our terrible imagination about what we think they're thinking about us. And it causes us to remain isolated. But we also have this great story that tells us that there's something more in our higher nature so that we're not separated from our true selves, the true person that we want to be, the true person that we know we can be and ought to be. And it's that that can put us right with God and others and ourselves. This salvation is the end of isolation and it's the beginning of celebration. And I also want to put in a word for that young man who was in a foreign land and he was feeding the pigs and he couldn't eat their food. That there are so many lost people. There are so many people who've been led astray. There are so many people who've been thrown 